Sub-Saharan Africa has seen a recent spike in the number of proposed dam projects due to the fact that they spark economic growth and provide energy to the developing area. However, studies have found that the stagnant water of a dam has resulted in these sites becoming areas of high malaria risk. Additionally, the dams alter the flow rate of a river, which can create conflict between neighboring communities. The current water crisis and political unrest of this region make the need for solutions to the negative impacts of dams especially critical. There are more than 15 dams and hydropower projects across Ethiopia. While some have been completed and are already operating, others are still under construction. In dam areas, it is impossible to drain the water to prevent mosquito breeding. Experts say the only solution is prevention and treatment. The country's Ministry of Health has deployed experts to the region's surrounding dams. They are identifying malaria-positive mosquito larva. Definitely it's possible, but it's not easy to control malaria uh, unless we have a good planning, good uh, investment, and good understanding, also good participation of the community. It will be difficult, but it's possible. Why not? We are also planning to go for malaria elimination. We believe that it, water is alive, that it is for healing, and all our ceremonies, there's a many, many ceremonies that has to do with water. Uh, that's, that's very, it's very spiritual in our culture. Um, okay, when you dam it up, we believe that you kill the water, that it's no longer alive. What happened in uh, the Telco Dam Project, and the lake that, that goes around the trail that you'll see, um, was the last piece of the Little Tennessee River that was flowing. And after that, as I understand it, there's no part of the Little Tennessee that's flowing anymore, is it? No. I mean, it's one dam after another after another. It had been on the books since way back in the 30s or something other to be done. And they had actually run out of work for these people to do, and it was to keep them busy, to have something to do. And the other thing, well, why did you take so much land way above the high water mark, get up on these ridges and stuff for these views and everything? And he said, well, we needed to get, they wanted to get rid of the people that live in those areas. And they took the land from them. We thought we had them with a snail darter. Uh -huh. But then Jimmy Carter, for the first time, says, oh, I'm going to just going to circumvent the Endangered Species Act, forget that little fish and complete the dam and go on, and that's exactly what they did. Mm -hmm. we, we kind of held back and we were just kind of watching, and after the snail dart was, um, was just kind of bypassed, we, we sued them on uh, the American Indian um, Religious Freedom Act because um, it's a very spiritual place. I mean, that's where our sacred fire was. It's, uh, it was so sad because I remember watching on TV the bulldozers just coming in, just like the do the burial sites, coming in and dozing the farms, just like that. If you were a farmer and you owned 100 acres and, and you know, after they did the survey, they're going to they're gonna say, well, 60 acres, they're going to be underwater. They condemned your whole property as a way I understand it. <coughs> and if there was anything left over, they sold it to developers. And is that correct? Yes. Uh -huh. And I was very vocal. I was a student at the University of Tennessee, and I was also a pioneer for, in the class action suit against Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, I know that it's necessary uh, to some extent. Um, we can talk about solar. We can talk about passive solar. We can talk about wind. And I think those are very good alternatives to, um, to, the, to damming up the water. Let us begin our tour around the world, where we will show dams which affect most of our lives. Our first stop is at the Issaquina Dam. The Issaquina Dam, completed in 1959, was the result of the Flood Control Act of the 17th of May 1950, which authorized the Hartwell Dam and Reservoir as the second unit in the comprehensive development of the Savannah River Basin. The Issaquina Dam now serves as flood control for the surrounding cities. The dam is not used for the creation of hydroelectric power, but is a popular attraction to fishermen and outdoor recreation enthusiasts. When visiting the dam, it can be noticed that the water on one side of the dam is stagnant and still, while the other side is moving downstream and is of cleaner quality. Our second stop is on the Baker River located in Chile, South America. The people of Chile strongly oppose the construction of a series of five dams on the Baker and Pescura rivers. 
These dams would have flooded 5,900 hectares of land in order to generate hydroelectric power. Other alternatives were considered afterwards to make up the difference in energy productivity. The people had used the argument that construction of the dams would have led to a negative effect on the community in such ways as damaging tourist attractions, culture, and the wilderness, all of which were primary sources of their economy. We are now coming to our third stop, which is at the Aldea de Villa Dam in Spain. This is the biggest dam in Spain, generating over 1100 megawatts, which is about half of what the Hoover Dam generates and may be seen as a sufficient source of electricity for that area. If it were built today, it would cost half a billion dollars, which is not an amount of money that a lot of countries have lying around to spend on such things. We are now heading to a dam in Maniuchi, Zimbabwe. The construction of the Maniuchi Dam was intended to provide electricity and irrigation to the surrounding communities. However, lack of funding and consideration of consequences have left many to suffer from the dam's presence. The flooding upstream of the dam displaced local villagers to different districts, causing political conflict. Those that remained on the banks of the Maniuchi have yet to reap the benefits of the potential hydropower plant that has yet to be utilized. The planned distribution of water for irrigation also failed to reach its potential. Only commercial farmers have received water from this dam, leaving local farmers to fend for themselves during times of drought. From an ecological standpoint, the change in river flows created by the dam has replaced the hippopotamus population with crocodiles, thus altering the fish species in the dam. Most critical is the spike in malaria risk in Maniuchi. Initially at 0% risk, residents surrounding this dam are now at 28% of contracting malaria due to the stagnant waters that breed malaria-carrying insects. The Maniuchi Dam is a prime example of the magnitude and diversity of issues that can result from the construction of a dam that is not suited for the job. Hundreds of dams across Africa have caused parallel consequences and have heightened the pre-existing issues of political instability, malaria risk, and water and energy shortages. Now as we arrive at Bangladesh, you will notice the lands affected by drought. Droughts are relevant in areas all around the world and have many environmental, economical, and social impacts. Numerous Asian countries that are less developed are facing these impacts. These countries are including Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, Myanmar, Afghanistan, Yemen, and Cambodia. Each year, Bangladesh experiences six to seven months of drought. This low rainfall typically occurs between the months of November and May. These droughts are becoming more frequent within recent decades and are typically affecting about 47% of the country's area and about 53% of the country's population. Droughts in Bangladesh negatively affect plant growth, loss of crop production, food shortages, and starvation. Dams are being considered as a tool to help alleviate some of these negative effects in the area. Now we are approaching the Tepai Wut Dam in Manipur, India. This dam is intended to provide flood control and hydroelectric power. However, due to the water right conflicts between India and Bangladesh, the need to relocate Manipuri residents to construct the reservoir, and the environmental concerns of the project, the project continues to face delays. The Brahmaputra board, who have prepared detailed project reports on several mega dams, including the Taipai Mook in Manipur, have stated that the value of the Taipai Mook hydroelectric dam for India is not just for electricity generation, but is an integrated project which would reduce the need for flood control improve infrastructure and economic development in the region, while boosting installed power capacity, all of which would help the government to achieve its ambitious targets unveiled in the run-up to the parliamentary elections. However, the potential costs and dangers of the project are likely to be many, including environmental degradation, social unrest in affected provinces, and a possible increase in bilateral tensions between India and Bangladesh, which could potentially be exploited by nationalist parties. Our last stop is at the Shiman Dam in Taiwan. This dam is used to lower the effects of a flood or even stop a flood from occurring in the area. This dam creates the third largest reservoir in Taiwan and allows rice to be grown year round, which is a good thing for their economy. But it is believed that this dam causes and has caused more harm than good. The dam has caused 2,000 residents to be moved due to the large reservoir and it costs a ton of money to create. However, people like to visit it because it is so extravagant and thus its beauty of architecture may allow them to create uh, economic tourism. After viewing so many dams around the world, we are beginning to think that overall, they cause more harm than good as the only positive outcomes are isolated success of agriculture and electricity generation. The negatives consist of loss of residents and wilderness, an increase in disease, 
and also the dams are quite costly. So from my early interest in my studies in ancient history, I'll talk about the Nile River in Egypt and the Aswan Dam. And then in our backyard, I'll talk briefly about two novels about damming rivers in our area, Deliverance by James Dickey, famously turned into a, an award-winning movie that was filmed on our own Stuga River up here in the mountains. And the Ron Rash novel, one Foot in Eden, written in 2002. There was an old Aswan Dam in the mid-50s. President Nasser built the high dam, the new dam. It was purposely to control for floods, generate power, and manage the reservoir in order to prevent the serious consequences of drought. And during several severe drought periods since the 1950s, many people died in adjacent lands, but Egypt um, managed to keep a small flow coming down from the high dam and maintained enough agriculture and had enough water to, um, to get through the drought without the severe consequences of, of others. When Hartwell Dam was proposed, the federal government went around offering to buy people's land that would be covered by water once the dam was constructed late 50s, early 60s, when the water started backing up. Most landowners voluntarily were happy to do a regular land contract as just a purchase and sale. There were two holdouts, and one was Clemson University, the other was a little old lady with a shotgun. A little old lady with a shotgun claimed she hadn't been approached with a proper offer and they um, finally did buy her out. I believe there was litigation involved in her settlement. Clemson was to have been flooded. They were going to actually, they contemplated relocating the football stadium up where the ar armory is now. That whole part of what's the campus would have been underwater and the compromise they made was the dike where a lot of people like to go hiking and running and take their dogs for walks. And our beautiful Clemson University wastewater treatment plant is built along the dike. Um, that saved the part of Clemson from flooding and that enabled Clemson to stop legally resisting the eminent domain proceeding that would have naturally followed its refusal to voluntarily sell acres to the federal government so that the Army Corps of Engineer, Engineers could build the Hartwell Dam. With Joe Cassie, from what I learned from that novel, they were poor, their cotton crops had been failing, and the money they got for their useless, valueless land enabled them to move to Anderson and get jobs in the textile mills. There's a very interesting book that I mentioned, Ron Rash, One Foot in Eden, 2002, dramatizes what he has learned anecdotally and from his imagination, um, the, effect, the impact on families displaced from their lands. If they were attached to the land, and there's a lot of feeling about the home place in families that go way back in these parts. Here we are at the Isocrina Dam. The Issaquina Dam stands 25 feet high and spans 150 feet across, creating a man-made waterfall that drinks excess water from Lake Issaquina into the Kiwi River. The dam's main purpose is flood control, but it also has become a popular spot for hikers. The Issaquina Dam has not largely affected humans, as it is not used for hydropower or irrigation, but its construction definitely impacted the pre-existing ecosystem. Dams create changes in flow velocities and water temperature, which can alter the varieties of species that can exist there. As it can be seen here at the Isaquina Dam, the water quality in the Kiwi River escaping the dam appears to be a higher quality as compared to the water that is nearly stagnant behind the dam. 
So from this, we can see that the movement of water is equal to life. When we approached the downstream side of the dam, we discovered a fisherman there who had come up to the river on a motor-assisted canoe. The water on the, of higher quality was teeming with fish and the area was more suited to recreation. The more significant dam in this area is the Hartwell Dam, which was completed in 1962 and flooded over 50,000 acres of land. This massive project resulted in the relocation of three sections of railroad, the raising of two railroad bridges, construction of six sections of new state highways, and nine sections of county roads, the construction of nine new bridges and the raising of four existing bridges, and the relocation of two power transmission lines. Clemson first objected to the damage to be caused by the Hartwell Dam, as it would have claimed 7,000 acres of their beautiful forest and the football stadium. It was eventually decided after a long legal battle between the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and Clemson College to divert the Seneca River around the college lands using two diversion dams. It also met much lawful resistance with citizens executing their constitutional rights under the Second Amendment, as in the case with Miss Elizabeth Brock and her daughter who bared arms against the government trying to remove them from their land without proper payment. Miss Elizabeth Brock eventually settled out of court when the government offered her $6,850. These are prime examples of the riverside consequences of installing a dam. All residents, businesses, and infrastructures must be moved to make way for the floodwaters. This can also be seen today in China where over a million people living on the banks of the Yangtze River must relocate for the construction of the Three Gorges Dam, which will become the largest dam in the world upon its completion. The people in this area of China, however, will not have the same privilege of constitutional rights that we can use here. Dams are undoubtedly an incredible feat of modern engineering. With each new dam, more rivers are being drastically altered in terms of flow rates, sedimentation, and flooding, which make them unpredictable and unreliable. Such changes can cause massive economic, political, social, and environmental disturbances that will compound on the consequences we already face today. If we are to continue to rely on hydropower, there must be global efforts to move away from building more dams and move towards more sustainable solutions like turbines. Existing dams must be removed or re-engineered to reduce the environmental impacts made. Additionally, there must be societal efforts made towards maintaining the water balance within a watershed in order to keep rivers flowing. These solutions will not be easily reached or implemented, but small changes to our approach towards hydropower helps guarantee a sustainable future. <laughs>